So please welcome to the stage chefs Matt Ginn and Christian Hayes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. And I know we've got a lot of uh, CHOP fans out there, and we're going to get to that. Because uh, I know if you saw their shows, they were uh, pretty fun uh, to watch. But I wanted to start a little bit tonight. I know I've interviewed you both several times. I feel like I know you pretty well. And then it dawned on me as I was preparing for this that... I don't really know much about your background as far as why you got into the food industry in the first place. And so I was hoping we could start by talking a little bit about um, your background. And I know, Christian, you're, a, as Lisa said, you're an eighth generation Mainer. Mm -hmm. And I understand your ancestors were lobstermen. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's, um, my dad was in the, uh, the fishing industry. And uh, all of his brothers, as well as his parents and uh, my great grandparents, were lobster. Um, you know, they lobstered off Long Island and the Casco Bay Islands, and <clears throat> so yeah. So the, the it goes back to I think maybe like the 1600s or so when they eventually made it to upstate Maine and then made their way down to the down to the islands right here. Yeah. So is lobster a favorite ingredient <laughs> now? <laughs> I, I, I mean... Got it in your blood. Yeah, you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love lobster idea. It's a very diplomatic <laughs> answer. <laughs> and you started as a, um, as a dishwasher. Tell me a little bit about that. Was that out of necessity, or did you, were you thinking you might want to get into the food business? I was thinking, you know, I was trying to figure out how to pay for my own stuff. That was about it. Um, I got a job pretty early. Um, you know, I started out as a caddy, and that was the worst job in the entire world. You made like 20 bucks for a full day <laughs> carrying a millionaire's golf clubs. And then, um, yeah, and then I just kind of, it was kind of a natural thing. Like, you know, you don't really need to apply. You don't need a resume for, to wash dishes. So I just jumped right in um, and then sort of fell in love with the kitchen from there. Uh, so and just kind of worked your way up from yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. So then, I mean, I would hope that every every cook starts there because it's, it really is the most important, important job in the kitchen. Um, and I guess after you've been, after you've done it, I guess you realize really how hard it is. So. Here, here. Hey. <laughs> I hear that from a lot of chefs. They wish they had more applicants who started at the bottom and worked their way up instead of wanting to jump right in and after a week on the job, be on chopped. <laughs> <laughs> or they graduate, you know, they graduate culinary school and they just want to jump, jump right in and be a sous chef. But I don't know. The industry doesn't quite work that way. What, um, have you ever been tempted? I know... Uh, Matt worked in Boston for a while, I think, or didn't you work in Boston I did. for a while? I worked in Boston for a while. And um, uh, other people who were from Maine, other chefs, um, Chris Gould from Central Provisions was born and raised in Bethel, and then he went away for a while uh, to work in some larger cities and gain more experience. Have you, you, you're now raising the ninth generation of <laughs> yeah. Mainers in your family. Yeah, I don't yes, think I can go anywhere adorable now, but... daughters. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever have any yearning to go off and... You know, not really. Um, and I haven't. I've been sort of grounded in, in Maine, um, and I'm okay with that. Honestly, like, I've always seen Portland and southern Maine um, through, you know, that lens of, hey, you know, if I was vacationing, I'd be like, man, I can picture my life here. Uh, <laughs> and so I've just kind of just, uh, you know... Dug in, and I love it. I really don't have any, um, you know. I don't. I don't need to live anywhere else. I'm well, good. the food scene's exploded so much here now. Anyway, I mean, you're kind it was of pretty a part. Too. You're part of one of the hottest places in the country. Now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, it's 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 great, and um, you know I've traveled here and there, um, but uh, just to visit, you know, and I I really do. I really do enjoy it here. Yeah. And Matt, I, what about you? I know you've your roots are in potato country, right? Yes, half of them. My anyway. father's from Caribou, Maine. Yeah, <laughs> he's here tonight. So um, he's from Caribou and grew up with a dad who worked in the potato business um, for a period of time before he moved out of that business. I think that any kind of food business can be a challenge to, to make ends meet. And um, but yeah, rooted in in Maine from through my father and grew up in Cape Elizabeth and I'm still here as well. And I, I, and I agree with um, Christian sentiment that it's, it, you, you, you go away, you go travel in other places and you come back and you're like, drive along a road and like, there's the ocean. There's, you know, there's Casco Bay. They're just driving over the bridge. This is pretty picturesque. Um, I see no reason to, to change as well. I enjoy where I'm at. Wow. Um, and do you think, I mean, how, how important is it to you guys to have your own, well, you're working on your own restaurant, which we'll get to later, but sure. have you ever, I know you've got a great gig now at Evo, and you're also in charge of Shabby Island Inn. How yeah. difficult is that to juggle the two? It, it's a challenge in, in the height of the season, and I, we were actually just talking about this. It makes it easier in, in the winter, you know, and juggling a couple operations, it's, it's got its ups and its downs, like anything. Um, in the, in the summer, it's a juggling act. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a cook, a firefighter, um, a babysitter, and um, <laughs> a whole lot of other jobs as I bounce between the two, making sure they're operating okay. But um, in the winter, dad. and a dad. dad, thank you. For <laughs> Job number one. Um, but in the, in the winter, it, it in fact probably makes it a little easier because to keep good staff, which is such a headache um, here in Portland, it's been a constant issue. Um, in, in food and beverage and hospitality, any chef, any restaurateur will tell you, finding good staff, maintaining good staff is, is one of their top priorities and one of the biggest issues. Um, and so in doing that, it allows me the sales of a, a very enormously busy three months to keep people annually, year round, which gives me more flexibility and freedom in the winter. So although my life is more hectic in the summer, um, I wouldn't trade it or substitute it for what I have in the winter. Wow. And do you you have do you have your own garden out there at on Shabiga? Yeah, the Shabiga, restaurant we have our we have a chef's garden. We, there's a farm, um, as I understand, Shabiga at one point was a, a a real agricultural producer for Portland. It brought a lot of vegetables in, and there's a farm out there called the Second Wind Farm, which was originally a farm a hundred years ago, and has now had a new owner and and brought a nice breath of breath of fresh air into it and is operating again. We buy some vegetables for the restaurant, and um, and it's it's really um, you know given some good things to the restaurant, and um, um, the the location should be although again challenging to get a bunch of local product out there and operate it um, with the location of the the farm and our garden that we have on site, we're able to do a few things. You know, I was I met with a sales rep today, and I was like. He's like, one thing I can get for you. I'm like, look, pal, you're never going to beat the big company's prices on, on paper goods and little things like that. You're never going to get the seafood and shellfish and lobsters I get on Shibig Island. But what you could get me would be some local tomatoes. And it's <laughs> amazing. how like, this, The second one farm that we buy from is great. They do greens and turnips, beets, and arugula turnips, beets, and some radishes. But like to do a tomato from seed in Maine is a very challenging thing. I don't think people realize that. Like... If you go to the farmer's market here in Deering Oaks or um, down on one city center, to get a tomato, it's a very challenging thing to like come from seed. A lot of them are starting right now in a greenhouse. And um, I was like, get me some main tomatoes, get them in the height of the season, get them out, of me, get out to me, and we can talk business. So <laughs> um, that's how I answer my garden. We got some cool things in my garden, but nowhere in as, as many tomatoes as I, would, as I will serve on the island. Yeah. Um, so that's it, what's a typical day like for you in the summertime, or, you, or do you uh, do you go out to the island a couple of times a week, or and, and then come back to Evo, or how do you juggle that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I uh, the most honest answer is I'm on a need basis. In the beginning of the season, when the the restaurant starts up, I'm there more often. Every single year, I um, remember once 
trying to explain to Rob Evans from Duck Fat, you know, about this situation. He's like, how are you, man? Sounds like opening a restaurant every year. And that's exactly what it is. It's, you're opening a restaurant every single year. I get to keep one or two people. But we have a staff of like nine or 10 cooks. So it's really retraining and rewriting menus every year. Um, and that being said, it, it's in the beginning, I'm out there more often. And then once the plane gets, you know, off the ground, you picking up speed, picking up speed, picking up speed. Next thing you know, you're going 300 miles an hour and you're in the air. Um, it, it can run itself a little bit better and, I, and I'm more at Evo and then come with weddings and functions and as Christian knows well from doing all the catering, you know, the big weddings, the big days are, are real reasons to be out there and, mm -hmm. and to be having my foot down. So um, need basis. But again, it, it, you could get a call on a, you know, arbitrary Thursday being like, your sous chef has mono, she's going to the hospital. No one's here to wear a grill. And I will leave Evo, drive up to Cousins Island, catch the boat, and go work the roast station. So it's um, exciting. It's really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> that sounds awful. Yeah. Sounds really um, cool. Is it also Short kind answer. of a nice change, though, because you're, you're doing the Mediterranean thing all the it rest is. of the year. Yes, yeah. And I would imagine it's nice to change up your menus a little bit. To be able to go and yeah. do a proper lobster bisque or clam chowder or just <laughs> fry a piece of haddock is always, joking and no jokes aside, refreshing. I mean, it's like fried haddock. Refreshing, fry later? No, it's not refreshing. <laughs> but it, it is. It's nice to, like, just get casual with yeah. your food and, like, you know, it's not always... Sometimes people are like, oh, you use tweezers at Evo, you got this and that, and, you know, fair, make, make fun of the fact we use tweezers. But <laughs> it's nice to, to remove yourself from that for a minute and, and to do food that, that a, being a dad, that a three-year-old might eat more and, and things like that, so. And I guess we didn't touch on your, uh, I'm curious about what, what attracted you, what made you want to be a chef? I remember on your Chopped episode, actually, you talked a lot about being a little unfocused when you were younger and partying a lot. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what was it that turned that around and what made you think chef <laughs> as opposed to I think the, truck driver? Or yeah. <laughs> Anything, you know, truck driving probably would have had a lot of benefits from that department as well. <laughs> but um, I think it was the energy and the atmosphere, you know, whether you're, like, for me, being in a classroom, you know, there's this new idea of, like, how do, how do kids learn, right? Like, what motivates someone? I sat in a classroom as a kid, and I was just like, you're wearing a purple shirt. He's got moccasins on. Look at this person. <laughs> Always, this guy's wearing a salmon colored shirt, you know. Always just kind of moving around a lot. And so when I got in the kitchen, there were so many moving pieces and focusing that it was actually like encompassing. I, I was thinking about the things that were occurring around me for a, an end goal, for, for a, you know, what went to the past, what, uh -huh. what the, the same goal that we were all striving for. So I was able to embrace that and luckily found something that like my personality would be conducive for. I hope we all can do that. Um, and so that's what drew me to it. Whereas like when you're sitting in a classroom for me, I wouldn't be the best. Just sitting here with you talking, I'm like, all right. <laughs> but you put me in a kitchen, you give me a knife in my hand, we see orders come in, you gotta put stuff away, you gotta go cook, you gotta put more things away, you gotta set your station up. There's just so many moving pieces that yeah. the adrenaline and the excitement of that really captures. It's a way of channeling that energy. Exactly, yeah. yeah, physical energy, yeah. 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 Um, you seem much more, you seem so focused on chop. <laughs> Speaking of chop. I think I was just scared. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are a little scary, but it was much worse. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. Way scarier. It's the worst. Well, well, I know people. I know everyone wants to hear about this. So um, I know uh, Christian. Your episode was called "Pork on the Brain," <laughs> and Matt was Matt's episode was called "Room for Shrooms." Good for and, a partier. And <laughs> is that too dark? <laughs> Reeling it. <laughs> um, so, why did you guys want to do the show in the first place? Were you fans? Had you seen it before? Or did you want the personal challenge or what? Didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it until. I don't know. I I find cooking to be sort of. Um, I don't know. I don't do it to be 
the best at it. I don't do it to compete with anybody. I do it just because I love making food and feeding people. <clears throat> and there's a connection there and can get all meta with it. But like really it's not about it's not about being in fact I think that's the, the toxic side of the industry that I hate. It's like the egos that can sort of infect um, you know the industry in the kitchens where a lot a lot of, a lot of dudes cook because they want to be the best and I, I just cook because I love it. And so I fought, I fought the, I it was pretty steadfast, like, because a lot of people were like, you should do this, you should do this. And I was just like, absolutely not. That's not why I cook. That's not why I cook. And then eventually the um, catering chef now, Dandelion, Caitlin, um, she was like, you really, really should just, just do it. And I trust, I trusted her. If she was going to push me, and I don't really have a lot of self-confidence, so, but I respected her opinion so much that I was like, all right. So it's like, it was probably one of the few, like the last days to turn in the app. And uh, there were some casting directors that had been bugging me too up here. And we had talked about that. I think they got in touch with you too. And I just said no constantly. Um, so I just filled out the app. And like three days later, it got real. They like hit me up. <laughs> I got a text and an email and it was just go time. And so I reluctantly, said yes. Why don't, you, why don't you start down that rabbit hole? <laughs> yeah, it was over at that point. I mean, they really, they really lock you in. Um, and, you know, you end up doing like a hour-long FaceTime and then a phone call with a producer, and they really kind of vet you and put you, ask you what, you know, you would do with these ingredients or what your favorite, you know, they want to make sure you know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, step one. Um, and then, and then it started to get a little exciting, you know, just because, and I, and I went in just thinking, all right, this will just be fun. Um, Did you have to do any live cooking in front of them? Or? No, but they would, they would ask you about different ingredients and what you like cooking and what would you do, what would you make. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, and they made it, you know, it was really, they were great to talk to. It was really easy. It was kind of a seamless thing. You're just kind of chatting about food, about your story, about where you came from. Um, yeah, and then it just kind of, and I honestly, like, I know you had said, they were like, you're in, and it was kind of a concrete thing, but I still didn't, just, the, I, I found their texts and emails to be sort of ambiguous, so I really didn't know if I was in or not, even throughout the interview process, and then finally it was like, all right, when they came and filmed the bio pack and everything up at the kitchen, they were like, we'll see you in, you know, we'll see you in New York. I'm like, oh, okay, so I guess I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. What, what did you think about the, the questions and that whole interview process? I know Austin Miller, who also, we've had numerous, they come fishing up here a lot. We've had a lot of chefs here compete on Chopped, and we've had six winners, the latest being Figgy from uh, Figgy's Fried Chicken. Um, but I remember Austin Miller from Mommy was telling me that he was really ticked off by the questions here. All the things he doesn't like to answer, like, what's your favorite thing to cook? And yeah, what? yeah. I mean, it's pretty, I don't know. I mean, it's a TV show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're just trying to get a feel for <clears throat> and they want a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they want to take something and then build it into a story. And I get that. And, so, and that was, again, that was part of the reason why I kind of was reluctant. Just because yeah. authenticity for me is everything, like, in terms of cooking. And so... I mean, of course, they're going to take... So they did. I mean, they took me... I was the nervous guy at first, you know, even though, like, they just, like... You know, they take the clips that they want to show, but... You were just the nervous guy. You could tell you were nervous. Was <laughs> that so wasn't just nervous. a label. <laughs> you had yeah. sweat coming off. Yeah, your... yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, never again. <laughs> They've emailed me twice. I'm like... Mm. <laughs> I know a lot of chefs are worried it's going to be like a game show or something. And, uh, I mean, that's kind of what it is. And but. That, uh, yeah. Um, and I've heard from all the chefs I've interviewed who have been on it, They, most people think, you know, reality shows and uh, shows like this are faked and rigged. But every chef I've interviewed who's uh, been on Chopped has said that's not true about Chopped, that it really is the real deal. So, I don't know, Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to do it and... Um, it's definitely the real deal, just based <laughs> on what you just said. Um, and I, I share, again, the same kind of like idea that Christian had. I didn't initially want to do it terribly. 
I didn't feel I needed like validation from a cable television show to tell me I was a good cook. Um, and in fact, was more reluctant. That pressured me to be more like, I'm not participating in this. I don't need this kind of PR. You know, there's already a game we all played to be chefs, and it's my least favorite part of the job. Um, so I didn't. I just looked at it like this is just such frou frou on top of already other BS frou frou I do. I'm just not going to do this. <laughs> As Christian mentioned, there were a lot of media outlets in Portland. They came up with a really aggressive large casting call, and they contacted people that had done this through this media group, a couple media groups, two different ones, and they just kept pushing your name. <laughs> and um, I have a, uh, the predominant owner of the Prentice Hospitality Group that I run is a, is a gentleman my age, and he was just like, dude, do it. You know, win, lose, or draw, do it. It's good for the business. And I think the, the part where I disagree with Christian more is I was like, well, if I'm doing this, I'm winning this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, I cook to be better than people. Yeah. And you know what, though? Like, I, I, we were just having a, uh, a beer across the street at LFK with some people who are here, and uh, one of them made a comment like, do you guys know each other? Like pink shirt, tattoos, <laughs> tattoos, pink. And it was just, maybe I was reading into what she was saying, but it was like, you know, what I think is very cool about the main scene is that we're all very different and do things very well. And like, I'm already super excited about the food Christian's posting for the garrison. That being said, when I cook, I cook because I want to be better than you. I want to be faster than you. I came from playing a lot of sports. I went to Chevers. And like, if we're breaking down chickens or we're doing anything, I'm faster and better and stronger than you. And, um, <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> like, and there's certain skills that I'll, I will put myself up against anyone. And I, know, and I, and I think having some self-awareness as a cook or anything that you do professionally is important. Like, not the best at baking a cake. You can get ultimately frustrated when I'm like, 975 grams instead of 950? Oh, I hate measuring stuff and little things like that. But I like a sharp knife and I like to move quick, like we were talking about earlier. So again, I just was like, not interested. But win or lose a draw. I knew it helped the business, and so ultimately that was my reasoning behind it. Um, and to your point about the integrity, I did three shows. I, have n I had no idea what was in any basket, except for the few times, and Christian will attest to this, that they make you act more surprised when you open the basket being like, ooh, it's a pig's ear. <laughs> Looks like a pig's ear. Smells like a pig's ear, not that surprised. But a producer will be like, act effing surprised and you're like well then they tell you when they tell you not to open it because they film so it's like a lot of stop and go and they'll be like you know don't open your basket this is just you know ted's gonna say open your basket but don't open your basket <laughs> so try thinking about what you're gonna cook while you're like mentally like don't do it don't every do it, don't time do it. i open that <laughs> basket dude they so they have they have a they have a towel that's over the ingredients for people like me <laughs> They go, open your basket. <laughs> and everybody, you can just hear the 30 people in black go, <sighs> like, reset, reset the shot. <clears throat> Valuable union dollars going right down the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, let's back up just a minute, and then we'll get more into the show. But I'm also intrigued by, well, first of all, how long did the whole process take, but also... I'm intrigued by the intrigue behind it. Like you go to New York and you go to meet at a McDonald's or something. So it's or the same to, thing, yes. Yeah, so yeah y'all talk about that. A so little you bit. meet at a Harlem McDonald's at 5 a.m. With are all the other chefs there? So too, you just or? I walk in, I look around, and there's probably three people there. Two um, do not look like they're going to be competing on chop that day. <laughs> two, are, two are wearing McDonald's uniforms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of them has a McDonald's visor on, and then the other one. Has a, has a knife bag, so you just you sit down with them. Um, and then, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's very strange. And we actually had, so there's always an alternate, too. So in case, for whatever reason, in case, you know, you, if you do something stupid, you're out, and the alternate will take over. And this poor guy flew in from San Jose just to be, or no, San Antonio, just to be a... Uh, an alternate. That's so, funny. That's the biggest difference. He, and he was, he was grumpy. And <laughs> we had a great group of people. And so the alternate was, was grumpy. He, he, did not, he wouldn't even meet us. He was just like, he was ready. He was ready. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't. So he went home after like the first round when they realized that things are flowing. Then the alternate goes home. But yeah, you meet in this McDonald's. Then you, then you walk. And then you walk a couple blocks. And it's this 
building in Harlem, and it's unmarked, and you go in, there's security, and yeah, and it's all just old, it's an old building. Yeah. My alternate showed up seven times. He was smoking cigarettes and more relaxed than any of us. Like, <laughs> I've been here eight times, and every time I show up, they just keep paying me a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even, yeah. Oh, we had an alternate. And eventually you walk and walk through that building, and eventually you come to a TV studio. Well, I mean, you're in the studio immediately. Security yeah. all around. It's unmarked. And... Um, you're eventually led to a very hot room, hotter than this right now. He's yeah, that's the nice, quest room. It's no joke. Yeah. It's terrible. And they feed you the worst food ever. <laughs> you spend most of your, they make it very clear you're an employee from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're and contracted. They, and they take away your cell phones? They take your, yeah, you empty your pockets. They take your knives. Um, and, then you're, you just, and then you just sit there. And, I mean, there's hours and hours where you just sit there. Yeah. Like joining the CIA or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then they'll pull you out to do, you know, they you walk down the hall, they film that, and they do all that. But then, um, yeah, then, like in between rounds, especially like the lunch round where all the union guys go away for, what, like three hours to eat lunch? <laughs> <clears throat> You're just sitting there starving and hot. Yeah. I mean, you were saying, like, I mean, it takes, it's a, if you make it to the end, it's like a 16-hour day. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's fun. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, did you have fun on chop? I was like, oh, I enjoyed winning, but it wasn't fun. It was terrible. I'm surprised to hear good. they didn't treat you a little bit better as far as feeding you decent food. It was like craft right. services. Yeah. That yeah. thing, yeah. It was fine. Yeah, not fun. Well, speaking of... Uh... <laughs> not what I do on my day. On your day off, what are you doing? I'm going to go compete on chop. Just because yeah. you know better to do. Speaking of uh, decent or indecent food, Christian, you're in your first round, you had... Your basket had pig face roulade. Yeah, that's Yum. Awesome. Yeah, it's actually really good. <laughs> and a pork chop cocktail, which didn't actually have a pork chop in it. But yeah, it was, it was made all the accoutrements of, that yeah, would that go, go with, with the pork. Yeah. Pork chop, and you made a a, a pig face salsa <laughs> for yeah. your tacos. Yeah. So. It was good. Except, I don't know, you know, you guys might not have seen it, but I made, I was the guy that made the mistake in the first round. Um, and then, sort of uh, hoped that somebody else made a bigger mistake, <laughs> which is chopped in general, I guess. Um, oh, you didn't uh, char your tortilla. I didn't char the tortilla. I ran out of time. Um, but uh, somebody else messed up. So, <laughs> so I, I got to kind of get my footing. But, yeah, like that first round for me was, it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. So it was sort of you just grab an onion and start cutting, you have no idea what you're making. Um, and so I was just off. And then sort of the second round, the landing gear came up. D dessert round, I was, wasn't, wasn't even sweating. It was like, there, here we go. Yeah. I was curious, um, when you open that basket and you see these often weird ingredients, I think Matt uh, lucked out with the mushrooms. Easy. But <laughs> Easy. Uh, it, it, and you have to immediately start thinking, what am I going to make? And there's a clock ticking, and you're under all this pressure. How does that compare at all to your? Does it ever get that intense in your kitchens, or are you have you ever had to like just grab some ingredients and come up with something? I, on I the think spot? the time limit is the most fictional part of the whole show. The oh. integrity is there that you don't know what you're cooking, you don't know what you're about to cook, and you actually have to cook next to people right next to you and just and just cook and hope your dish is better. But nobody operates in the real world under 30 minutes unless they put themselves in circumstances that they're really trying not to succeed, you know. I, I show up to work early. I show up to mic checks early here this afternoon <laughs> because I want to succeed. And like, I don't think anyone comes up, sure, you might get the occasional, I'm vegan, I don't eat gluten, I, I don't eat eggplant or any other nightshade family, and I'm starving, and I hate your menu. <laughs> And so you're like, okay, let's cook for this person. Uh -huh. But fortunately, you just canceled out about 90% of the things we have, so you're gonna get... A glass of milk. Yeah, you're gonna get <laughs> some broccoli with olive oil. Yeah, yeah vegan, vegan. Did, did, you say, did you say lactose? Um, <laughs> but nobody makes a dish in 30 minutes. It's just ridiculous. Go home and peel five cloves of garlic and tell me how much time you have left. Like, this. just... <laughs> It's, well, yeah, I mean, it's sort of and like... And the stations the, are a disaster when you're done cooking. Yeah, yeah, they're a mess. Yeah. Somebody else gets to clean them up, though. <laughs> That's true. But, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like the security, the reason why I like cooking so much, too, like, is the mise en place, is the preparation and being ready for 
for for the show, you know. And so, you know, when you're in a restaurant, everything's dialed in, everything's ready, it's waiting. There, you got spoons and knives, and that's it. And you no idea what you're cooking with. <clears throat> nothing's prepped, nothing's chopped, nothing's in front of you. And so that removes that sort of removes any sort of security that any chef has. And they have a large pantry. And in, in, by pantry, I mean like a large area you can grab things, both refrigerated and dry. But that's even more daunting, because you walk over, you're like, oh my god, I can do everything. <laughs> you know, like, and they change it every round. Especially yeah. with mushrooms, man. You could, yeah. It, it, yeah, I remember you talking about that on the episode. You could do any, anything you wanted. Well, yeah, exactly. The possibilities are limitless if you sat down and thought about it and wrote some ideas down. But writing is not an option. They don't have a pen and a pencil in that <laughs> yeah. Do the other contestants like give you the stink eye, or are you were you all pretty friendly? <laughs> we had a, we had a great group. I was super fortunate. I mean, um, we all because I mean we didn't have our phones. So and literally when somebody when you go out to get judged and they send somebody home, you never you don't see them ever again. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen any of them. Not even backstage. They're gone. They disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so we made sure prior to get everybody's Instagram handle because that was the easiest thing just to sort of remember and then post show sort of connect um, because we didn't have any phones we didn't have anything to write that stuff down oh yeah so um, but they were awesome they're great I got super lucky because you always get the, you know you see shows where you get the cocky you know you just get yeah you get jerks you know I had to watch my mouth there for a second. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was I was so stoked to have yeah we were all really supportive and even they don't they they tried they tried in the episode to sort of create that narrative of towards the end there's like you know, competition but we were we were both kind of proud of each other. Well, and it looks like you're sort of stuck in a room together in between while the judges are judging, they put you in some room where you're all exhausted and talking about what you've just done and it yeah. lasts like 30 seconds on the episode. How long are you actually stuck in that Hours, room? Hours, right? Um, An hour. Well, that's the room that they show that you you talking is the room you're in all day. Yeah. That is the room that you're in all day. I mean, you can't even go to the bathroom. Like if you need to go to the bathroom, they need you need to wait until multiple people need to go to the bathroom. And then, so you're like, oh, and I, I gotta go to the bathroom. They're like, all right, yeah. And then you, and then when they take you out, the person taking you out says, chef, chef, chef's walking. And then you'll hear somebody else call back, chef's walking. And they do that so that they know where the chefs are at all times. And that's pretty much to protect the integrity of the show, which we were saying it's the real deal. So you don't see, like even when we started, you don't see the judges, judges you don't see the yeah. food, you don't see the pantry, you don't see anything. Um, so it's it's like it's tight, it's locked down. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had Figgy. Figgy's not here tonight, is she? Uh, she told me the best anecdote. Did I tell that? I I know it's okay because she told me for the newspaper. So I'm not telling tales out of school. But she was uh, 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 getting ready to start competing, and she was so incredibly nervous. She went to the ladies' room. And she was in there by herself giving herself a pep talk, going, you can do this, Figgy. You've got confidence. You can make it. You can just get out there and do your best. And, and eventually one of the producers came into the restroom and she said, are you all right? And, 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 are, and are you ready? And she said, yeah. And she goes, well, you might want to know your, your mic is on. <laughs> and all the... <laughs> All the other contestants and all the judges have been listening to you. Give yourself this pep talk. And then uh, she was one of our winners in the end. And she said, uh, when she won, one of the judges said, I think you should use some of that prize money on a little therapy. <laughs> That's the best anecdote. Uh, and before, while we're talking about interviews and before we get off the pigs, Christian gave me one of the best quotes I've ever had as a food writer here. Oh, where, no. When he was given in his, one of his baskets the pig brains and gravy and milk gravy. Milk gravy, canned. It was pig canned brains pig brains. And, milk gravy, yeah. and he told me, he said, 
you could rub it between your thumb and forefinger and it would just melt. It was really <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the brain, and the brain cream, which cre actually created a hashtag brain cream. Yeah, I don't know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> was it hard having to taste that? <laughs> I, I, I put a spoon right in and tried it. I mean, um, it's, it's, I haven't tried cat food. But I can only imagine that's what cats eat because it smelled, it smelled like fancy face. It was pretty gnarly. It's like this pink milk with, um, put it through a strainer, and then you actually get to see the like, coils of the brain, the little wrinkles. <clears throat> and so I picked it up, and yeah, you just Yum. kind of go like this, and it's kind of sinewy, and it just kind of melts. It's really gross. Um, Better you than me, my friend. Better but the judges loved it. <laughs> Chris Santos lo really liked the brain cream, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Never again, but people are like, oh, you're going to do that to the garrison? Is that on wedding mm -hmm. menus for kidding this summer? <laughs> brain cream? Uh, yeah, that was gross. Really, really gross. gross. It looked pretty gross. Everything else, I mean, they give you random stuff, um, but they always got to give you that one thing that's a little. Did you have one? That was like out there. They just had mushrooms. Yeah, I mean, come on. I think my weirdest thing was the monkfish liver, probably. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you're from Maine, and you knew how to cook yeah, that like perfectly. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I was cooking the, the, you know, one of the judges was like, "Have you ever worked with this?" I'm like, "Once or twice." He's like, "Once? What does that even mean?" I'm like, "Oh no, I've eaten a lot of miyaki in Portland, yeah. Maine. It's awesome. You should try miyaki." Is that Martha Stewart? No, this is a carrion. He's like, "What do you mean miyaki?" It's like. Forget it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> visit, visit Portland. Yeah. He knows how to cook it, and he's taught me because I've eaten here a dozen times, you know, so. Um, yeah. Not brain cream. Better him than me, I said earlier. It's, yeah, that was, sounds a, disgusting. Shot, that was a shot in the dark. I just knew it was, you know, it was canned meat. It was minerally, um, yeah, cream, uh, sour cream, acid, lemon, chives, brighten it up. And I think that brings up a good point, too, just about food, not to interrupt you, but yeah, it's like, yeah. you say monkfish liver, and maybe some of you out there are like, Ugh. I had like this beautiful, fresh monkfish liver. The food was, that yeah, we were when in. they gave you a cut of meat. That did look good. Well, you said canned, because we're about to go with this. Well, right. So if you were on the Japanese auction, the monkfish liver I had was like a delicacy, and it was awesome. So, again, remove like squeamish ideas of a monkfish, like those little, you know, lights off the top of their head, big fuck fangs in their face, and crazy looking animal, but like, <laughs> seriously, but, but Ankimo just... is the foie gras of the sea, I did. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you had pig brain, not fresh, like, heritage breed, Maine Farms pig brain, you had canned pig brain. <laughs> yeah, the other stuff, on meal. the other end, I mean, they had mangalitsa lardo, they had, I mean, they had really good cuts of pork. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they just gotta, they gotta mess things up a little bit. I think yeah. one of the judges even said, if I had that pig brain, I think I'd strain it first. And oh, look, Christian strain. That happened a couple too. times. Every, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about what your relationship was like with the judges. I know, Matt, you had Martha Stewart, a part-time Mainer, as a judge. Did. And did she talk to you about Maine? Or, she did. That, yeah. was, that helped me, for sure. When she was on the <laughs> champions round, it would have been uh, helped me even more. But um, <laughs> she was very nice. Um, Martha Stewart, as we all know, is a successful person. Chopped is not the end all be all for her, so she was a very regular person on the set um, and very kind and, and mentioned that she spends a lot of time in Maine and really likes it. Whereas the other judges, during the judging, you could sense that they were creating television. You had these moments where they were giving you these high praise and low praise and nitpicking. And at one point when I watched the show, there was something about like, hiding a bone like a dog, and then on the show, it's cut off, and it's like, hiding it like a dog, it sounds horrible. But at the end, in, in, on set, she says to me, you hit it like a dog, but it shows me that you're a good cook, and you're not getting tripped up by the basket. Yeah, they don't show you that, though. They no, don't show you the praise. Sure, they definitely didn't show you that. Um, I've heard there's a lot more praise that goes on in general. I think there's a lot more than, dialogue, you know? Yeah. It's like I, 10 minutes. Like they're either ter they tear you apart, they lift you up, they tear you apart, they lift you up. And it's like 10 and, minutes of And for me, the judgment. person who went away on the first round had no praise. Somehow they were able to squeak a sentence or two out of praise. But they were getting destroyed the whole time, you know? They forgot components, they didn't complete. It was kind of like, thanks for showing up, but the job is to put four plates together. 
we've talked about the time constraint, and I mentioned how I think it's the most fictitious kind of TV, not realistic aspect of cooking. No one cooks in 20 minutes, but at the end of the day, it's a game. It's a game. Put the food together in 20 minutes. First rules, do it in 20 minutes, and then see if it's good. If you don't do it in 20 minutes, well, then you're already done. See you later. You know, wait, wait to not do that. And he didn't do it in 20 minutes, so yeah. they, they, were, they had nothing to say to him. They're like, dude, you... You stunk. You didn't do it. Why well, do we have two incomplete plates? Like that's, this is rule number one. Thanks for ruining the show today. <laughs> it, was, it was a very similar situation with, with Ryan Andre, the, the chef who made it to the end with me. And um, his first two rounds were like, I mean, you couldn't touch him. They were, he, his food is great. Um, and we got to desserts, and we're looking at each other. Do you do, you do desserts? <laughs> it's like no. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. And so we went out, and um, I got fortunate enough that I, when I saw the ingredients, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Because um, <clears throat> my wife has been in pastry, and she's done that stuff, and I picked her brain a little bit. <laughs> but uh, Ryan's final round, um, yeah, I mean, it was the same thing. It was hard to watch. The the, the, and they didn't really show that on TV. Um, you know, they made it a little softer for TV, but they really let him have it. Yeah, and my I, point. Felt, I felt for him because he's a tremendous chef. He's a fantastic chef. He just opened his spot down in Baton Rouge. <clears throat> but he just, for, for whatever reason, um, came out the gate with two amazing dishes and then um, just kind of fell, and they let him have it. And it was it was hard. I felt so so bad for him because it was yeah it was ten minutes of just tearing him down. Mm. Point being is the, the praise and the criticism is muted on, on either end on each end. You know to make good television, yeah. you're not going to see all congratulations and you're not going to see all the, the the berating that can occur when when you're there. So and given the way television works and the number of takes they have to do. Is the food cold by the time it gets to the judges? Usually, I've always wondered Yeah, that. and they have to take that into account. They, they do take that into account. So they'll just eat it cold and then yeah. adjust in there. Yeah. And it's funny because you have to do four plates. You do three judges and one for pictures. But they take the best one for the pictures. And so if there is any chance that there's one good one and then maybe one that's struggling a little bit, like the last one you got to garnish, that's going to a judge. Mm. Cold. <laughs> um, you know, before I go, uh, I've always wondered this, Matt, and I didn't ask you the other day, so I'm going to ask you now in front of everybody, that you were part of, there used to be a local version of Chopped at Grace, that, yeah. that it yeah. was a benefit, sure. uh, for, and you participated in that? I did, yeah. Did, how did, <laughs> did that help prepare you at all for the real thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think 100%. Um, now the uh, was the Share Strength, the Good Shepherd Food Bank did a um, four or five years running yeah. chopped competition. I was a judge the first year. There you go. With you Rob know. Evans and yeah, I don't. Rob was a judge for me and um, Joe Riccio and uh, who else was there? Yeah, Some Jeff other people, but um, absolutely prepared me. I mean, it just helped put in perspective that like it's going to go by really quick. And um, although Rob has been a veteran of Chopped as well, put together some baskets that I think are very um, realistic to what you'd see in the Chopped kitchen. It's, it, it, uh, it, it definitely prepared you. It may be a little easier. He might, his baskets might have been a little more forgiving. No canned pig brains in, in cat milk, but um, <laughs> <laughs> basically what you said. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> but he, but it was still challenging, and and you had this sense where you're cooking live, timed in front of people, and had to be ready to go. Yeah. Well, I I remember asking Rob Evans once if he would do it again, and he wouldn't be crazy about it. But he admitted that it had really helped his business, and that um, duck fat the had gone up, you know, twenty percent like every year after he was on those mm. shows, and. Um, so I'm wondering what some of the aftermath was for you guys. The immediate aftermath, didn't it crash your website? It didn't crash it, but I remember, so uh, yeah, my phone, because I do the website stuff too. I love doing the design, and so 
I get I literally get a notification whenever somebody hits up Danny Lyons' website. It says a visitor from, and it's really cool because you can see a visitor from Bangladesh is on your website or whatever. And um, I'm sitting there, and the show starts. The intro. We had a watching party, and just my, my phone is just going crazy. I pull it out, and it's just hundreds and hundreds. California. I mean, just. And then I mean, it was <clears throat> sort of sobering. It was like, oh my god, like this is. Yeah, everybody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> not just Glad people, you won. <laughs> not just my friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, insane. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 crazy the reach and the following. And like, I mean, I'm what third season thirty seven. 36, what are you, 38, something like that? The last oh, cha champions, I it was 41. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. That's a long run, you know. People are pretty diehard. And then I'll know when there's a rerun. I'll be sitting, it'll be 10 p.m. on a Tuesday night, sitting in the living room. Do -do 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 -do. My phone <laughs> starts going off, and I'll go, and I'll check, and it's, it's running. It's already yeah. running. Yeah. <laughs> What, what about you? I know you guys had a party the night that you won. Right? We did, similar yeah. fashion. You're shocked the amount of people that, I, I think it's humbling and it's interesting to see yeah, how many people wild. watch Chopped. We've had, I've had people come into the restaurant and be like, I've never missed an episode of Chopped. You're like, there's 40 seasons, you shouldn't tell people. That. <laughs> <laughs> We're all pretty much the same. Yeah. <laughs> seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Am I right? Um, but, it, you know, it's cool. And, and I had seen a few before I went on. And I remember watching um, Christian's Air before mine did. And even before I even considered being on the show, friends of mine from Boston had gone on in one. And um, so, yeah, your business, it helps. I think, as my, my, my owner said to me, my, my, my business partner said, you know, win, lose, or draw, it'll help the business. I think anyone who goes on that show and it's just themselves can probably be like, it helps, you know. You had people it's... asking for selfies too, didn't we you? We get selfies, yeah, 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 absolutely. Celebrity. That's right. I'm, yeah. I'm not doing it again. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah. And uh, Matt, you went on to be on Chop Champions where you're playing for 50 grand. And um, I'm wondering, what was... How is that experience different from the regular chopped, and how heartbreaking was it <laughs> to lose after to you not won? come home? Yeah, with yeah. The 50. I mean, um, one, yeah, it stunk. I didn't win. That for sure is being what I said before. I went on the show to win, without a doubt. Um, how was it different? When uh, we we talked earlier about, did you have you know an asshole in the group or someone who's a little more cocky? First time I went on the show, not really. I had one person who was more quiet. I think they were just, I think they were a little overconfident, but their time was short-lived anyways. The second time when I went on Champions, immediately there were two people, the four of us who had won, that were like, I'm gonna beat you all, you know? And that was interesting. I remember sitting, as, as an employee, the first thing I said when I got on here, one of the first things was like, you're an employee and they make you feel that way. The minute you're done cooking, they take this chair and they, Turn it around and like sit here. Don't look at the judges and face, don't say a word. You face, face the, the wall. Yeah. yeah, face the wall. <clears throat> and so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this guy. He's like, I'm from Arizona, and like and a producer will come up to you and kind of like go over quickly what you're going to say in front of the judges because they want to make some good TV. And they're like, so why are you back? And he's like, I'm from Arizona. I run a diner, but I want to prove I can beat some more fine dining chefs like this guy. And you're like, Dude, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> Beat me? You just made a hash, like you made a potato. Like, um, I didn't say that. My mind said that. My mind said a whole lot worse. I was like, what? Um, but, but that happened. You know, I'm sitting there like, what? Like, he just, you, dude, I'm right here. Anyways, you're sitting there, and that was interesting because it was a different Did atmosphere. He no. Okay. I so no, so if I could take this mic off, I would right now. <laughs> I beat him and the other three people. Um, and then the, the, you know, we talked about, Christian said, you meet at this McDonald's at 5.30 in the morning in Harlem, in like lower Spanish Harlem. I have plenty of friends, Chevers High School graduates, people who live in Manhattan. And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about just walking up there. And one of them was like, what, what time? I'm like, I don't know, 5, 5.15? Like, in like the lower 90s, 100s to Spanish Harlem? 
Like, you can, just keep your eyes open. You might want to think about taking a cab, you know. It's not the worst neighborhood ever, but, like, you might want to think about taking a cab. And um, as I walked up there, it was, it was evident. It's an interesting experience. Mm. And you're standing there with these people, some who are now getting more aggressive. So I win the first show, and I go back for the third show. And I'm sitting there with everyone who's just happy to be there. We all won the first round of champions, and now it's four champions on four champions. And I was just thrilled to be there. And it's 5.30 again in the morning. And the first question from the three other champions is, who had to go yesterday? Because I went on Thursday and showed up on Friday. So I did a 14 and a half hour day of filming, you know, cooking, but filming fake television. Went home and slept for about six hours, got some food. You better believe I had a strong IPA. Saw a friend of mine from New York real quick and went back to bed. But I had like a four hour nap when I returned. And the producers ensured me, they're like, look, every time we do shows like this, this has to happen. Someone's gotta get the short end of the stick. This time it's you, you know, good luck. And so when I walked back into the room that day, they were like, who went yesterday? I'm like, I went yesterday. And immediately that set the tone for the, for the day. Where, people, where a couple of them still a little more standoffish, we're sitting here competing for, you know, people are like, what do you do with $10,000? It's like, I don't know, after you pay taxes and a credit card bill, what does anyone do? You, you know. <laughs> Like, let's, and come on. Yeah. It's crazy how quick it goes. Yeah. Well, that was going to, I want to let the audience in on this a little bit too, but uh, before we do, I just wanted to ask you both what you did with your prize money. I know, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we'll just <laughs> kind of put it right back in the machine. Restaurant. Yeah, I mean, because the restaurant's opening and it just kind of goes right back in. I put some hardwood down on my house too, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it just kind of went back into just more <laughs> every day, you know. With food, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of money going out the door. Is, so. any, is any of it going into the new restaurant? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, so we, I mean, we did put it back into the business, so yeah. maybe indirectly or directly, it'll, it's making its way right back in, yeah. He's opening a new place in Yarmouth called Garrison, and when are you expecting to open? Mid-July, yeah. And yep. I'm shocked that no one's ever opened a restaurant there before because it's beautiful. It's right on the river. Right on the river. Yeah. yeah. So we're in the middle of moving our catering kitchen off the river, building a brand new one, and then building the restaurant in the spot where the catering kitchen is right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And Matt, what did, I think you said you paid bills, right? Oh, I just, yeah, I paid a couple bills. <laughs> I paid some taxes. Next thing you know, you're left. You know, my, my wife's phone coincidentally broke like that time. It's like, but phones cost $1,000. <laughs> There's 10% of it, you know? Like, um, oh, that's true. You know, and, and what I was going to say was that, the, yeah, is that $50,000, I think, put, can put more pressure on someone, but um, $10,000. When you, you know, before taxes and before oh, we, we both have two kids. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <It's gone. laughs> 10K? It's gone. <laughs> okay. Well, um, let's open it up a little bit. If I don't know if anybody in the audience has any questions. We have someone coming around with a mic. Yes, Please. just raise your hand and I'll come to you. And wait till the mic gets to you. Anybody? What? Back there. Yeah, yeah, wait. Do you want to stick your hand up one more time? I'm like sinking into this couch. <laughs> Take a nap. Hi, I was just wondering if either of you learned any new techniques or saw something that you actually didn't already know uh, or some way of treating uh, an ingredient that hadn't occurred to you? What, what did you take away from it besides briefly the 10,000? I mean, for me, I went, in, I went in feeling pretty vulnerable and then pretty quickly you get invested, like, because you don't, you get emotionally invested. Like, I, I say, like, oh, you know, I was just in it for fun, but right right after the clock starts ticking and you realize like you know you're competing i wanted to win you know and and so i kind of i walked away with sort of a feeling of um you know i'm i'm a pretty self-conscious dude so i think like i felt a little bit better about my about being able to handle a competition like that that's about it i mean big brains too i realized <laughs> <coughs> can be used in a way but but, but for me, honestly, it was just sort of I took away kind of a personal sense of I did something that, um, you know, it's 
pretty special. I thought I thought it was pretty cool. But. I think that's a great answer. Outside of the personal confidence boost that we probably both gathered from it, in the amount of time you have to cook, I think it'd uh, be hard to be like, how many grams of butter went into that one? <laughs> um, and and that being said, the, the last round that I did in, against some champion on the champion show, the woman who was cooking next to, next to me was a very talented chef. Her technique was sound, and she ultimately won the show. And she was uh, um, a very good cook, you know. Um, and in doing this show, I got to meet her a little bit. As Christian mentioned, we got to become social media friends, things like that. And so there's been a, probably a greater takeaway in the months you know, months and months and days and days after the show than in the immediate 20 and 30 minutes. I don't think there's much recipe sharing or technique sharing at the time. Um, and, and certainly not a lot of takeaway from the technique. Um, confidence boosts and kind of like more lifelong friends, I think is the most accurate way I can say it. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Thanks to both of you um, for coming out tonight. I think it's inspiring and wonderful. Okay. Probably not the easiest thing to tell us all about. But <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask what formal training that both of you had or did you learn on the job from Dishwasher Up? Did either of you? So I think when we first all got together, we Thanks. shit on culinary school for about 10 minutes and then. <laughs> 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 and I don't mean that, sorry. Um, I think really, I mean, we're just, we were brought up in kitchens. Um, and I think that education, that knowledge that you can gain uh, is invaluable. Um, and I think it's far superior than learning out of a book. But there are benefits to that. But I, I learned on the job and I learned um, how to handle the rush and how to, how to make sure you're, you're prepared for that. And you slowly, you work under different, you know, the tutelage of different chefs that provide you with different knowledge different dishes, um, and we were talking just before we got here, You, when you first start out, you might be making you know, one of the mother sauces, but you don't know the origin, you don't know the history of that, but you're making it really well. And then over time, you sort of realize you gain that other acumen, but the sort of <clears throat> instant knowledge of the preparation, you're gaining foundation without even knowing it, and you're gaining it in a high-stress environment, which School can't teach you. School can't teach you how to handle, you know, 150 covers and like that. But. Yeah. I, well, neither of us went to culinary school. Um, and I think for the vast majority of people, culinary school is, is a waste of time and money. But there's actually a, a, a former cook of mine, who Christian knows a little bit um, here tonight, that went to culinary school. And um, I think if, if you have the means and are willing to work hard and put your nose down and commit to it, culinary school can give you a quick boost. Um, as I said, she's here tonight, and um, it has given her a leg up at, at an age where she's so far beyond most of the people around her, and has already gone on to do bigger and better things after working for me. But for the majority of cooks that come through my kitchen, you're gonna learn from me in a year, far more than you're gonna learn in culinary school in a year, and I'm gonna pay you to do it, rather than pay to do it. I mean, now the price for culinary school is, I mean, it's, it's like 50 grand a year. Wow. And you'll be paying that off when your kids have loans. And especially when, you're, when you get out and you've got to make 12 bucks an hour and work 50 hours a week and you can't afford to live in the city that you're cooking in. It's tough. Um, but that's not, you know, I have culinary grads that work for me. Um, and... Um, and they're phenomenal for it, but it takes that special breed. I think what you were saying is the people, that special breed, that go to culinary school and learn those foundations, and then they, they have, they're sort of ignited, and they go, yeah, I think they there's go some, from there. There's some scary statistic that the majority of people who graduate from food and beverage and hospitality majors, whether it be like a BU program or CIA or NECI, within five or 10 years, aren't in the industry anymore. I think there's, some, there's like, I can't quote the source, but there are some concrete evidence. And in my 14 plus years of cooking experience, I would say that's very accurate. I've met plenty of people who went to NECI or CIA or SMCC here in Portland, and they, and they don't cook anymore. Hi. 
As an older graduate of the French Culinary <laughs> Institute in New York City, I, I went there strictly for my own edification. Do you think the chefs today are, are just, it's too easy? Do you think you're, you're doing easy recipes, your easy menus? I'm thinking, uh, uh, don't laugh. I, I'm, think, I'm thinking of, you know. I'll take this one first. <laughs> the, the food I'm doing at Evo is, and I don't want to sound cocky to everyone here, but if you have been living in Portland, Maine for 10 years, the food I do at Evo is better than anything that existed here in Portland, Maine 10 years ago. And I, I say that like Evo confidently. very much. Thank you. And I say that confidently and concretely in someone who cooked here 10 years ago. I think so, too. Um, having been in Stockholm in, uh, in October, I was blown away by some of the amazing food there. And I spoke with one of the chefs, and he's, it's a global thing. I mean, not just in Portland, Maine. We're so happy to have you all in Portland, Maine. Um, but it's sort of like rising tide lifts all boats. So everyone is going to, you know, gain from the worldwide experience of the food business. Thank you. <laughs>
I had a reservation once. My wife was seven months pregnant, and she was like, I can't do the two-hour drive right now. And there's not many places to stay up there. But she's obviously doing something right. <laughs> You're on. Um, she's obviously doing something right. Um, the cookbook that she produced um, about a year and a half ago is fantastic. I actually bought it from one of my, my cooks who spent over two years with me and, um, and powered to her for, for being able to do what she does in a short season. And um, yeah. And just so you know, the postcard thing isn't all that. I had a, this year, I had a good friend who was going to send in a postcard, and she messaged me. She goes, you want me to do one for you, too? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we, uh, the post office postmarked the wrong side of the postcard, and we both got ours back in the mail. Aww. And I heard, so it doesn't always work. It's not a perfect system. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Matt and Christian, for joining us, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight.